Why didn't anyone tell me? I, never mind. Um, so, as you can see, the um, last week, la the last lecture is is up on the air. Um, it's on the UNSW TV site. It's under the title of Programming for Designers, so if you're in the Infosys class, you'll have to go searching for that. Um, uh, there's a link on the on the COM1400 blog, but I'm not sure whether there's a link yet on the um, on the other blog, but there should eventually be a link over here which says Lecture Videos UNSW TV, which will take you to the lecture videos. There's also a link here which says Lecture Slides, which will take you to PDF versions of the lecture slides. Um, so you can look at last week's lecture slides, uh, last time's lecture slides, aren't they pretty? Um, I will try to get the lecture slides up as quickly as possible, um, preferably giving you some time before the lecture, but since I'm writing them on the fly, um, doing that might be a bit tricky, because I only just got today's finished shortly before coming here. Um, so, that's exciting. Um, are we on the air, Morgan? That's cool, good, all right. So we might as well plow into it. We've got a lot, um, a lot of stuff. Tonight, where's the button? Here we go, play slideshow. Oh, and it's gone. Oh, and it's back. Oh, and it's gone. And it's back. That's exciting. Okay, so tonight we're going to talk about the foundation of object-oriented programming, which is objects and their corresponding classes. Um, so let me just untangle myself a little bit here. Is that over there? Um, yes, so right. Let's get into it. So object-oriented programming. Um, there are many different flavors of programming. Um, and object-oriented is probably one of the uh, most sort of common and popular flavors. But there are sort of a, a couple of different ways of approaching the problem of programming. And um, essentially, object-oriented object -oriented programming is one where we focus on the, on the fundamental building blocks of what we call objects and classes. And, we'll, and today, what we're going to do is look at what they are. Um, so essentially a computer program, because a computer program is about something, you're trying to do something, it has some real world reference presumably, um, the, the program has to somehow model, in some sense model what it, what, whatever the topic area is that your, the program is, is about. Um, and so and I'm going to just leave that in a very vague sense, but somewhere or other the program has an inf information in it, the building blocks of the program are, are somehow reflecting on, on the things in the real world that the program is about. Um, so from the computer's point of view, your program can be just, you can just start at the beginning and write everything down that it needs to do until it gets to the end. But like I said before, programs are not just for computers, they're also for people. And to make programming something that's actually um, that's something we can really get our heads around, any program of any moderate size needs to be broken down into chunks. Um, and they, we, need to, we need to have some way of thinking about it as, as a bunch of units that interact together rather than just seeing it as a whole mess of code that starts here and ends there and does who, heaven knows what in the middle. Um, so we need to structure our code in a, uh, in a logical fashion um, so that we can understand what we're doing more than anything else. Um, like I said, the computer doesn't care, um, but I mean, if you're going to be building anything of any reasonable size, uh, you need some structure in order to help you understand what you're doing and to help other people understand what, they're doing, what you're doing when they come to work with your code. Um, so object-oriented programming is, is a way of giving structure to your code. And we structure our code based around this idea of objects. So it's a, it's a fairly natural thing when we think about the world. We, we think about the world. We don't think about the world at its base level all the time. We structure things into objects. And so I don't think about this place as a collection of bricks and wood and pieces of cloth and whatever. I think of it as a classroom. Right? And so I take what's an enormous amount of infor information and I give it a name as a single chunk and I can call it a classroom. And then I can look at the things that are in that classroom and I can break it down into saying, okay, well this classroom contains a collection of chairs and those chairs are currently occupied by students and blah, 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 blah. And I can, but I can 
start to structure my experience in terms of, in terms of giving things names. And, and that's essentially all object-oriented programming is, is giving things names in our code and, and, chunk, and dividing our code up into big chunks and calling that chunk an object and that chunk an object and that chunk an object. And then talking about how those objects interact with one another. Um, so that's object-oriented programming in a nutshell. So you can all go home now and know and say you know what OO programming is. Um, so the fundamental building blocks of object-oriented programming is an object, obviously, and a class. And the distinction between an object and a class is, is slightly subtle but important. So if I talk about um, if I talk about chairs in general, just to pick an arbitrary thing out of the air, you can now all chairs probably have something in common. You know, a chair is something you sit on. Usually, it has a flat surface. It may have a certain number of legs. There are a couple of other things that that will be common about chairs. But if I but I can't uh, if I ask you the question, what colour is a chair? You know, that doesn't make sense, right? Because a chair could be any colour you want it to be, right? But if I ask you what colour is this chair, you can tell me the answer to that particular thing. So, a ch chairs in general is a class. Um, it, the class of chairs describes all the things that are common about all chairs in the world. This particular chair is an object, um, and this particular chair is a member of that class, or an instance of that class, and it has particular values uh, for, for its features. So if we said that um, chairs have legs in general, I could then ask, well, how many, chairs, how many legs does this chair have? And this chair, well, most of the chairs you're on don't have any legs. But um, you know, this chair has four legs. And well, most chairs have four legs, but many don't. Many have other numbers of legs. And so, so we can talk about the class is chairs in general, and we can say some things about chairs in general, and then we can talk about particular instances, particular objects, um, individual chairs, and what, what particular values those individual chairs have. Now, if I want to interact with a chair, I've got to have an object. I can't do something to the general idea of a chair. So you can't, you can't run just a class. You can, you, can only run, you can only execute code when you have an instance of that class. And so I can do things with a, with a I can like, you know, sit on, I can sit on a particular chair. I can't sit on the idea of chairs, right? Okay, so the difference between classes and objects is that classes are the general idea of, some, of, of an object, whereas the object is the particular concrete instance of that object. So this is going to come up again and again, and uh, we'll deal with it in a couple of different ways and different examples. So, to, to make this concrete, we're going to play around in BlueJ, and I'm going to show, give you a first taste of what BlueJ looks like, uh, and we'll just, can we minimize that? No, we can't. Oh, well, we'll just leave it there. BlueJ. So this is BlueJ. Uh, we don't want that one. We'll close that one. Oh, come back, BlueJ. All is forgiven. Blue J. Okay, if you close a window, it closes the whole, if you close all the windows, it closes the whole project. I did not know that. Um, okay, when you, when you install Blue J, it comes with a whole bunch of examples. So if we go open project um, here in the Blue J folder, there's an examples folder, and we're going to be looking at the shapes example this time. And now we can close that other window, and hopefully, yes, things will stay around. Good. Okay. So this, in, in here, in this example, we have three classes. This is the class that describes circles. This is the class that describes squares. This is the class that describes triangles. Uh, and we've got this fourth, fourth thing, canvas, that we're not going to worry about at the moment. But we're just interested in these three classes at the moment. So these describe the general idea of circles, the general idea of squares, and the general, general idea of triangles. Now, we can't do anything with those classes uh, directly. But what we can do is we can create, construct particular object, objects based on those classes. So if we come here to the circle, and if I left click on the, uh, right click on whatever the other click is, I can never remember. Um, they should be called like, you know, it depends on which, way, which hand you have a mouse in and which one's left or right. I, should, I call them click, clack, and cluck. So if you clack on the, on the, uh, on the thing, um, you'll get this option here to make a new circle. Um, and this, what this does is it prompts you, okay, 
we're going to create a new circle um, using this constructor, which we'll go into in a little bit more detail later. But we want a new instance of this class. And we have to, when we create a new instance, we have to give it a name. Uh, this is the name that we will use to refer back to it in our code. And so we're just going to call it circle1. And hey presto, now down here we have circle1. And this is a particular, ins and it says here that so circle1 is an instance of circle. And so, and here's a, um, a thing that you'll notice that we follow through. I talked about having coding style standards. Um, one of the first code style standards you learn is that objects have names in lowercase, classes have names in uppercase. This just makes it easier in our code to make it clear whether we're referring to an object or a class. Um, these, these names only occur within our code. They don't, they're not visible to the user at all. Um, so we can call them anything we want. Obviously, we, though, we want to give them names that are meaningful. I could have called this circle. Instead of calling this circle one, I could have called it C, or I could have called it the circle that represents the moon in the sky in winter time. You know, I could call it anything I want, or I could call it, you know, uh, well, there are some limits on, on what you can name things, but pretty much any name you want. You can't have spaces in the name, but otherwise you can do, you can go crazy. But we should have a standard way of naming things, and those names should be sensible, something that we can read and understand what this particular circle is for. And, um, and, some, and a s consistent way of sort of formatting that string. But we'll get, if you look in the, uh, the style guide that I pointed to you, they'll, they'll have um, advice on how to name things. But anyway, we have a circle. It's called circle one, and it's of kind circle. We can go here again, and we can create a square. And we'll go to the square, and we'll clack on the square, and we'll call it square one. And there's square one. And so down here in this, his, this is where BlueJ shows you the objects that it's currently working with. Up here, this is the diagram where it shows you the classes that you've currently got available. Now, um, so we, and we can create as many of these as we want. In fact, we can create two circles, and we'll call the second one Circle 2. It's very nice of BlueJ to keep suggesting names. Its naming scheme is a little bit boring, but you get the idea. So now we have four different circles. And the same way that... Um, that Hello? Oh, wrong button. There we go. So all of these are four diff different circles. In the same way that you can have four different chairs, they're all of the type chair, but they, they have different properties. Um, so we can have four different circles, all, of, all belonging to the same class of circle. Uh, it's fairly straightforward, right? Um, so if we go back to what we were looking at, um, so we can create instances out of classes. Um, okay, now... A class, actually, so, so that's all very well. We can have a bunch of circles sitting around, but we can't actually do anything with them yet. So the way that we actually do something with an object is to call a method on that object. Now, a method is a piece of code that makes that object do something. Um, so, yeah, methods provide ways to do things with objects, and we say we call a method or we invoke a method, or I might say we run a method. A lot, there are lots of different words for it. Um, but it's general idea of you, just, you, you, make, you run a method in order to execute the code to make the, the object do whatever you want it to do. Um, so if we have a look, now if we come back to our collection of objects, we come back to circle one, if we clack on circle one, we get a, this long list of methods that we can call on this circle. Um, and so the first method I want to call on this is make visible. And hopefully, ta -da, there we go, there is our circle. Um, it's a very exciting circle. Um, and then we can make it invisible. And hey, it disappeared. That's, so you can spend hours of fun making it visible and making it invisible. Um, but, so, but each of these methods does some, changes something on the circle, right? So it's a way, the method is a way of changing the circle or making the circle do something. Um, what we could also do is call the move down method. And if you paid attention to the circle, it made the circle move down. Okay. That's very exciting. Look at the things we can do. Uh, now if we come to one of these other circles, yeah, I don't have more room on the screen. Let's make some more screen real estate. We come to circle two over here and we make it visible. Hey, the circle two is up there, right? So now circle one, we call move down on circle one and circle one moves down. 
we can call move right on circle 2 and circle 2 moves right and so forth. So a method is run on a particular instance of a class, a particular object, a particular instance and it changes that particular instance. Um, it may do a bunch of other stuff as well but the idea is that each method is, while the method is defined by the class and so every circle has a make visible, proper, a make visible method, the, you can only run the method on an instance and so you have to have a particular circle in order to make that circle visible. In the same way that every chair can be sat on but you have to have a particular chair in order to sit on the chair, right? And if I sit on this chair, I'm not sitting on every other chair in the world, right? I'm only sitting on that chair. Um, so I can do, I can call a method on any particular object that I want. I can make a square visible if I like. Let's see what a square looks like. Woohoo! Oh, squares are red. That's very exciting. Um, so we have a bunch of objects and we can make them do stuff. Cool. Back to where we were. Um, so like I said, we call or invoke a method in order to execute it. And in BlueJ, you, you invoke a method by left clicking on it and just selecting the method you want to invoke. Um, later on, well, okay. So not all methods are just as simple as say, do that. Um, sometimes you have to give the method a little bit more information about like if I said to you jump, you might ask how high, right? And so if I, or if I said to you, you know, walk that way, you might ask me how far, right? And so in this case, you need extra, informa you need extra information for certain methods. So if we go looking at the, the, the methods on circle again, you'll see some of them have in the parentheses here after the name of the method, it has some information. So the ones we were calling before, those parentheses are empty, right? That means they don't require any more information. That'll just run as it is. But some of them have to have some, some stuff here in the parentheses. That stuff tells you what, what extra information you need to tell it in order to run that method. So if we, for example, choose the um, move horizontal method, um, we're running it on, I've forgotten which object we're doing, circle one. Okay, now it'll prompt us and ask us, okay, we need a parameter here, what value are we going to stick in there? Now let's see what happens if we, okay, there are no options there, we have to type in something. So how far do we want to move horizontal? Let's say let's move 100 horizontal, hey, and we moved 100, right, for whatever 100 pixels, I suppose, or whatever it is. And we can, we can run that again, and we can say move, uh, you know, negative 100. Let's see if that works. Hey, and it moves back in the other direction, right? So, or we could move one, or we could even move zero, and it would just do, no, do nothing, I presume. Let's see what happens if we move zero. Move zero. Eh, it doesn't move. How exciting. Um, so, the general I idea is that a method, um, some methods contain, need parameters. Um, so, I mean, yeah, I'm sure you've encountered this in many kind of ways in other, in other applications. You say, do this, it asks you for, you say, save this document, it asks you for a file name. You say, whatever, you know, it asks you for more information. These methods also have, have, need more information sometimes. And so, in the parentheses, when we call the method, we specify the extra information that it needs. Now, if you go back, if actually we look at that again, let's go back and look at that thing again. Um, when I selected this, it, we have this weird, so what it says in the, in the parentheses is two things. It has a, um, this thing int, and then it says distance. Okay, so distance is the name of the parameter, and that name can be anything you want. Generally, you give it a name that's sensible, but you could call that anything, right? Um, so again, try to name your parameters when, it, when you're writing your own methods, name your parameters sensibly so that someone looking at this, it's fairly easy to read that and say, that, I don't really know what that does, but it probably moves something horizontally by a distance that I specify, right? That's fairly clear. Now I could have called that method go and I could have called the parameter x and you look at it and say go x. I have no idea what that does, right? So name things in ways that make sense. Again, the computer doesn't care, but you'll care. Um, but what's this int thing? Well, that's the type of the parameter. 
So different, different methods require different kinds of information. This method requires a number from you, and so it, uh, it says int. Now, that int actually stands for integer, and it's probably a bad example of actually having good naming, but unfortunately we're stuck with int because it's been around since the very early days of programming. Um, but every parameter will have associated with it a type, which tells you, tells you what kind of data it needs. Um, and so the type, in this, in this case we were asking for an int, which is the type that represents integers. Uh, and so, and, in, and if you're not familiar with maths, integers are a whole number, i.e. a number without any fractional parts, can be positive or negative. Um, if it says string, then it means that it requires some text. Um, there are other types that you'll encounter. If it says float, it means it requires a fractional number. And I'll go, I don't think I'll even bother trying to explain why we call them floats. That's just a stupid historical thing. Um, if it says, there are other things that will go in there. But generally, you'll probably mostly be using ints and strings because you'll be mostly dealing with just numbers and text. Um, so, you're, uh, so every parameter will have a type associated with it, which will tell you what kind of information is necessary. Um, we'll, have, we'll go into types in more detail later, but for the time being, that tells you enough to get started. And like I said, how are we going time? Well, good. All right, plenty of time. Um, like I said before, we can create many objects from the same class. And we say that each one of those is an instance of the class. And in a way, each one of those is an in independent object. Now that it's been created, it exists on its own. It doesn't really care about whether there are any other objects of that kind. Um, but you need a concrete instance of a class in order to do something with it. Okay. So if we go back and look at our circles, let's not do that. Let's, uh, let's actually, I wonder if we can, can we destroy these? Remove, yeah, I'm going to clean up a little bit because I don't want all the, oh, okay, just those two circles. Oh, that's interesting. Let's make that go away and let's do this again. Make visible. Yeah, that square is still there. Oh, well, whatever. Um, that's curious. Oh, yeah, okay. Um, so we have two, two different circles, right? This is circle one, this is circle two. Circle one, let's actually, let's actually call another, change something about circle one so that we can tell which one's which. Let's make uh, change color. Here we go. What color should we make um, this one? Any options, any preferences? Green, okay, thank you very much. We've now got a green thing. Now, like I said, this, this uh, method has a parameter new color. That parameter is of type string. And so we have to put a string in there or, or some text. I'm just going to keep, I'm just going to call it a string. Um, I don't know why they're called strings. My goodness, that's an interesting question. It's, it's, they've always been called strings. Ever since I was a little boy, they were called strings. I don't know, it's sort of like a lot of letters strung together. Um, anyway, it's a string, and when you become a computer programmer, you just have strings. Sorry? Is that... <coughs> yeah, I know, but why is that called a string? <coughs> because you tie them together with string or something. Anyway, a collection of characters is called a string. Um, yeah, who knows? It just is, right? Um, when we're specifying a string, when we're in, in, um, in Java, we always need to put double quotes around it. So if we, if, like here, if we want to specify the string green, we have to put double quotes around, around green. Um, if we just type green without quotes, it'll give us an error. Okay. It says error cannot find symbol variable green. Um, I won't try to explain to you what that means, but it basically means it's looking for um, an object in the world that's called green, and because we haven't created an object called green, um, it's, it's saying that there's an error. Now, what we, want, we don't actually want to be looking for an object called green. We actually want the string green, and so we put quotes around it to make it clear that it's a string. Um, and if we do that, hey presto, it's green. Not a very nice shade of green, but it's green anyway. Uh, so we have two circles now. Circle one is green and circle two is blue. Um, what we can do is if we inspect a circle, huh, we can find out all the information that makes, that makes up this circle. Um, so 
every object has what we call its state. Um, and objects can change their states, but that state is, is all the information which we know about that object. In fact, in fact it's all the information which actually makes up that object. Um, this circle, there's nothing else to this circle other than this information. Um, so the information that makes up this circle is it has a diameter 30, it has an x position which is 20, it has a y position which is 140, it, it is green, there's a color which is green, and it's visible. Okay? If we look at this circle, it has a different state. You can inspect that one. Look at them side by side even. This one also has diameter 30. It has an x position of 40. Um, so it's a little bit further to the right. Um, so for those of you who aren't familiar with um, coordinate geometry, um, this is x, this is y. Okay? In fact, in this case, it's probably, it's probably starting from 0, 0 there. So y goes down and x goes that way. You won't really need to know that for anything we're doing, but you'll come up against that again and again when you're doing um, anything with computer programming and graphics is that any movement in the horizontal plane is called the x direction, movement in the vertical plane is called the y direction, and sometimes y is up and sometimes y is down. You, know, you just have to learn to deal with that because it's annoying. Um, but in this case, circle 1 is at 20, 140, so 20 across and, sorry, 20 across and 140 down, and, this one, and, and circle 2 is at 40, 60, so 40 across and 60 down. <laughs> And circle one is green and circle two is blue and they're both visible. Right. So now if we call a method on here, for example, if we ask circle one, let me do this in a way that you can see what's happening. If we ask circle one to move right, hey presto, the x position of circle one has changed from 20 to 40. So we've changed its state. Yes? Um, what's Boolean? Boolean? Ah, okay. Boolean is another data type that I didn't tell you about. We were going to get to later, but I'll tell you. So, and this one I do know why it's called Boolean. Um, George Boole was a famous mathematician who, who invented this. Um, you wouldn't have thought it needed inventing, but he invented it anyway because he was a mathematician. Um, a Boolean variable is a variable that is, either, is, that is only either true or false. Um, so the, the circle is either visible or invisible. Um, and so that piece of information, all we need to store is either true or false. And so that's called a Boolean data type. Um, so sometimes, you'll, um, sometimes the all the information it needs to know is whether or not you want something to be true or false, in which case it will ask you for Boolean data. Um, if you need more information than that, you'll need to use a different type. Um, we're probably going to talk more about Booleans later, but it's worth bringing up now. Um, and yeah, wouldn't it be great to be the mathematician who invented true and false? That would be kind of cool. Um, and everyone had to use your name in their programs forevermore. I wonder if I could get sort of the Ryan type, that everyone's doing a Ryan-y, ryan -y and no, see, that just doesn't work. Oh, well. Um, so anyway, and if we, so if you see, if we make, um, if we not, not click on the graphics, if we click on this one and make it invisible, there it goes, our, our is visible has changed to false. So that's the other value, it's either true or false. And when we're specifying this, again, notice now that there are no quotes here because this isn't a string. This is just either the value true or, it's the value true or the value false. There is no quotes. Um, so true and false are special symbols in our, in our language which represent these Boolean values. Um, but we can deal with more, that more later. So, so our objects have state. And when we call a method on an object, frequently we'll change the state of that object. Um, the, 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 the otherwise, the object will not change its state. So you can't, the only way of changing a state of the object is essentially by calling a method on that object most of the time. Yeah. Um, so there, um, uh, I've lost track of where I was. Let's go back to the notes. Always, if in doubt, go back to notes. Okay. So like we said, every object has a state. The state is just defined by a set of fields. So each one of the, these things is a field. The, com the combined set of those fields tell us the state of that particular object. And that summarizes all the information we have about that object. Like I, every, now the, the fields themselves are defined by the class. 
So every circle has a diameter, has an X position, has a Y position, has a color, and has a, and has a visible flag that tells you whether or not it's visible or not. But in a particular circle will have a particular value for those, for those fields which define its state. Another circle will have a different value to those fields. So the idea, so you get the idea of what we're doing is when we define a class, we, we, we're setting something that has a bunch of feature, common features but might have particular values for those features varying from object to object. Um, okay. So the other thing we can do is we can actually have objects that refer to other objects because at the moment we've just got objects sitting on their own. There's not very much we can do if they just sit there, sit there by themselves. So we can have an object which actually refers to another object. Um, and I'll show you that in another, another thing here. We'll close that. We'll open up a different project, the picture project. Oops, there we go. Um, so first of all, you can see in this little diagram, you can see in the class diagram, this dotted arrow means that this, objects from this class contain references to objects of these classes. So a picture has a triangle, a square, at least one triangle, at least one square, and at least one circle. It actually has more than, more than one of each of them. But a, so a picture contains references to other kinds of objects. And if we create an instance of a picture and call it picture one, and then if we actually, draw, well, if we draw that picture, oh, isn't that a beautiful picture? Oh, so lovely. Um, so you can see that picture is made up of two squares, a triangle, and a circle, right? And so now if we inspect the picture to look at its, its fields, we'll see that that picture actually contains a square, which is called wall, a square, which is called window, a, a triangle, which is called roof, and a circle, which is called sun, right? And so the, um, and we can actually go, and if we want to, we can click on, um, we can click on the square wall and inspect the square, and now we can see the square, this, just this square, and we can tell the details of just that square. Um, and this square is at 106, is, at, is 100 big, it's 60-30, it's, it's red, and it's visible. Right? Um, and we could, if, and alternatively, we could look at the window, and that's the window. And so it gives, you, gives us the details about the window. So, the, um, so what we have now is, is, a, um, is one object which contains references to other objects. Um, and then when we, when we call the method here, um, draw on the, on the picture, it then calls methods on all those objects. Um, so let me show you something here. Let's open up the, okay. So this is the source code to the picture. So behind the scenes, this is how the picture actually works. And there's a whole bunch of stuff here, but if we look at the draw method, this is the, the definition of the draw method. Um, there's a, whole, there's a whole lot of code there we don't really want to look at. But what it's doing here is you can see the first bit of code there creates a new square, which is the wall, and calls some methods on, that, on the wall. Then it creates a method, then it creates a square for the window, then it creates a triangle for the roof, and then it creates a, 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 a circle for the sun. And what we're doing here now is that rather than calling all the methods by hand, is that we're making one method call other methods. And so this is the draw method, but when we run this draw method, it calls these other methods on the other objects that it refers to. Um, and so the first thing it does is it creates a new circle called, and, and remembers that as the sun, and then it changes the color of that sun to yellow, it moves it horizontally, it moves it vertically, it changes its size and it makes it visible. And all of that happens when we say draw the, draw the picture. Um, so the idea is now that rather than doing all this method calling by hand, which would be rather tedious, um, is that we write methods that call other methods that call other methods that do, do the things we want to do. And, we have, and so that our objects are now referring to each other and telling each other what to do. Um, so let me close that for a second and go back to the slide. So objects can refer to other objects. 
Objects can, can store other objects in their fields as part of their state. And objects can, a method of one object can call methods on other objects or can construct other objects. So all the things we've been doing by hand, we can, make, we can do them in code. We can make a method which does those things. So you just, I just showed you the source code behind the picture. So the source code is the actual way that we write, that we, write we tell the computer about what a picture is, or for each class has its own source code. So the source code is the way that we describe what that class does, or how instances of that class work. So every, every object of the same class shares the same source code, and when we call a method on that object, it runs, it runs the commands that are in the source code for that object. So the source code is the way that we write our programs, by writing, writing that sort of thing. Um, any changes we make to that source code will change the behavior of our program. So if, for example, we come over here to the picture, we open up the picture source code, um, say we want the house to be... Um, okay, so the, so the window is black normally, for example, if we want the window instead to be blue, we can change our source code. And now we press the compile button. And hopefully, now when we create a new picture, and, dun -dun, and draw that picture, hey, the window's blue, right? So by changing the source code, we change what the program does. Um, the, now that compilation thing, let me go back and do that again. If I change this back to black, back to black, there we go. Now if I just close this window at the moment without pressing compile, what you'll see is that the picture, the picture class has now got those stripes on it. That means you've, you've changed the class but you haven't recompiled it. And what comp compilation does is compilation is where the computer actually goes and reads that file that I just wrote, uh, that I just edited, and turns it into code that the computer can actually execute. So the computer can't directly execute that text file. It needs to actually compile it first in order to turn it into something that it can, that it can run. And so, and at the moment, what this is saying is that I've, I've made some changes to pictures, but I haven't compiled it. And so if I run, if I run that method now, it'll still draw with a blue window because even though I've changed the code, it hasn't done anything. This is a trap that you'll fall into again and again, um, is that you'll change your code and then run it and wonder why it still does what it was doing before. And one of the main reasons why it does that is that you didn't compile the code. And so effectively the computer hasn't paid any attention to your changes yet. Um, and so what you need to do is press this button here, compile, and now the, 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 that goes away. Uh, the object that we created has been destroyed because um, when we change the code, we've got to create new objects. Um, so we have to create the picture all over again. We recreate a picture. We call draw. And now the window's back to being black because the code, is, the code has been compiled and the new code is being run. Thrilling. Um, we could go on constructing little, little houses out of shapes all day, but let's just move on with the thing. Um, so let's move to a different example, um, something that might be slightly less silly. Um, if we open the people project. Oh, what do you know? I have a cheat in 15 minutes. Um, the, um, so here's, this is a completely different project. Here we're talking about having some sort of database, presumably for a university. What did I just do? Um, and the objects in our database are staff and students. Um, don't worry about what that th the person in the middle means at the moment. But, most, but we're dealing with, we've got two different kinds of objects, well, three different kinds of objects. One is the database. Databases are one of the objects that we're dealing with in our model. The other thing is, the other objects that we're dealing with are staff and students. And so we can create instances of a, so the staff class describes properties of all staff members, but we can create particular instances of that to, to describe particular staff members. So if I create, um, now here we'll see there's, now we've actually been offered two different, these are called constructors. They're, they're things that you use for constructing objects. We're offered two different constructors. One is, um, one is the one, now, 
constructors are much like methods. They can have parameters in the, in the parentheses. And so this one is much like we had before. It doesn't require any extra information. But normally when you're creating a new staff object, you're going to have to give some information about that staff member. And you might as well give it at the moment that you create the staff, the staff member. And so we'll create a new staff. I'm going to call this, I'm actually going to call this variable Malcolm. I can't type my name without the R at the end anymore after years of typing my email address. Um, the, and now you need three pieces of information. The first one is a name, so we type in Malcolm. The second one is a year of birth, which is 1973. Um, and the third one is a, is a room number, and that's 401. Okay? And we press OK. Oh, and I made a mistake. Okay, the mis mistake I made... Ah, it's a string. Got to put quotes around a string. I keep forgetting. Quotes around a string. Dum dum, okay. What's it? Uh, oh, this one, okay, given it's a different error message, that one's really not very useful at all, but I know what that one is. This is also a string. So even though it's asking for a number, it wants a string, and the reason, I suppose the reason it wants a string is because a room number could be like 401F, which is my real room number. Um, so that's a string, that's a string, that's an int. Uh, and so we should be right now. Yeah, okay, so we created a new staff member. There's a lesson to be learned there. Error messages aren't always the easiest things to understand. Um, one of the things you'll find is that an error message is often rather cryptic. Um, this is the bane of computer programming. Um, in fact, error messages are much more understandable nowadays than in my day. It used to be, you used to get something like, what would you have got? Type mismatch would have been what you would have been told years ago. Now you've got something slightly more informative, but still rather cryptic. You have to learn, more or less, you're going to have to learn to get used to that. A good, a good thing about it is that because those error messages are so unique, um, they make very good Google search terms. And so if you find an error message you don't understand, copy and paste it into Google and you're, you're very likely to get an explanation of it. Um, so it's a disadvantage in that they're hard to understand, but it's an advantage in that they make good search terms. So we've made a new object. It's a start, it's, it represents me and it has some methods. Um, so we have a set room method which allows us to change what room I'm in. Um, and then we have these two methods, get room and two string. We won't really look at two string, but get room is interesting. Um, let's, let's run that one. It doesn't require any parameters. But when we run the get room message, it does something that the other methods haven't done before, which it actually tells, it gives us some information back again. Um, so some methods return information. Um, so if you wanted to find out what my room was, you'd call my get room method and it would tell you, uh, it would actually give you back a string which tells you what my room, what, what my room is. If we look at, at that, oops, where are we are. If we look at that method again, we'll see before the name of the method, we, it says here string. Whatever is here before the method, this is what kind of value it returns. So get room returns a string. To string will also return a string. That's kind of dull. Set room has the word void here. The word void means it doesn't return anything. Um, it, the computer, because the computers aren't very good at reading it, if we just left that off, the computer wouldn't understand. So we need to put something in there to say nothing. So the void essentially is the data type for nothing. And it means this, this method returns nothing. So if we call a method that returns nothing, we won't get a, re a return result. But if we call a method that has some sort of return value, then we'll get an, an object back or a piece of data back of that type. So if it, in this case it was string, so this gives us back a, a piece of data of type string. If it said int, we'd get back a number. If it said boolean, we'd get back a boolean value of either true or false. Um, in fact, if we go looking um, further, I might just in here, here's another method on it. I won't tell you, I won't go into details about where these methods come from, but here's another method we call year of birth, which returns an int. Um, get name returns a string and there's even some really weird ones in here 
which return other funny things that we don't want to deal about. Um, but in general, if it, if it has something here before the name of the method, then it'll return a value. Um, if it do, otherwise, it'll be void. So, go back to play. That's what I just showed you. So what I said, methods have return values. Return values give us information back from the method. Um, the return value has a type in the same way that the parameter has a type. It lets you know what kind of information you're going to get back. If it has the type void, that means that there is no return value. Good. Okay. So the last thing is I showed you before how objects can refer to other objects. So the fields of an object can be, can be other objects. In the same way, we can have methods. Uh, we can pass me objects into methods as parameters, and we can get objects back from methods as, as return values. So objects themselves are data. And objects are data that can be passed around in the same way that strings and ints and booleans are also data that can be passed around. So if we look at the database class here, the data, we create ourselves a new database. We'll call it database. Okay. The database has an add person method. The add person method has no return type. It's void. But it requires a, an object P of type person. And so person is one of our classes. In fact, person, uh, this forces me to explain a little bit. This, this business here means that um, this is what we're later going to talk about inheritance. Every, every class, every object of a type staff is also an object of type person. So all staff are also people. You know, I may, you, that you may dispute that, but, but in this case, in this program, it's true. All our staff are people. All our students are also people. Um, our database is not people, right? Uh, and so this, in this case, these arrows represent the fact that this class inherits from that class. In other words, everything that belongs to this class also belongs to that class. We'll deal with that in much more detail later. But in this particular case, we see that when we call add person method, we need to tell it a person which person we want to add. So we can add a staff member or we can add a student. Um, and so let's, in this case, call that method. And here now we have to have to provide a person that we're going to add. And now here, I can type Malcolm. And when I type Malcolm without quotes, I mean this. This thing here we called Malcolm before is now what I'm referring to when I say Malcolm without quotes. So when we create a new object and give it a name, we can use that symbol later to refer to that object, that name to refer to that object. So if we want to add me to the database, we take the name Malcolm, which is the name of this object, and we and we add it to the and we add, pass it as the parameter to add person. And now, hey presto! Well, you don't get to see anything, but now I I'm in the database. Um, we can see that by oops, wrong thing. This database. If we list all people in the database, hey presto! There I am, and there's all my details for the world to see. Um, so. What you want to get out of that is, the, is that objects are data, and we can pass objects around. Um, a good database would actually have also ways of getting, getting that data back. So if I said, if I asked it, find me, um, find me uh, who, who's in Office 401F, the database should be able to pass you back the object that is Malcolm. And then you can do whatever you want with that object. Um, at the moment, we haven't got an example of that. But da objects are data that can be passed backwards and forwards. Uh, where are we up to in slides? Oh, good. That was really well timed. So, whoops, I just added a blank slide. We'll just ignore that one. Not quite finished. Just wanted to say, labs start next week. Make sure you know where your lab is. Um, the lab exercises will be announced on the website. Make sure you check your own website. Um, lecture, video, lecture notes and lecture videos will be going up on the website, hopefully soon. Um, thanks for coming. I've got to go. See you later.